everybody for joining us for the Self Project Zoom Class 13, which the title of tonight's class is, I'm so confused, is, self in the, is selfishness good or bad? And I think that's like the, the unasked question that um, is begging to be asked. Oh, I see that it, it disappeared already. I have to do it a different way. I have to share a screen. Let's do it that way. It's going to make it easier that way. Okay. All right. So, uh, based on everything we've set up until this point, we've spoken about the importance about the self and how everything comes back to the self. And whether people are saying this question or not, what bothers many people is that it, it, essentially the embodiment of everything bad um, is selfishness. And we're talking about how important is the self. And we didn't even get started with the self project. This is all, like we said, introductory words. And so the, so the question is, so, so what is it? is it? Is it really a good thing? Self-love and all this self stuff, or is it bad? So let's first explain what, uh, what it is. And, and uh, the, it's so important to get the context um, for, the, for definitions. As, as I like to illustrate, I, used, I learned for a long time, years ago with my younger brother, Dudi, in Basement Medjushkavaya, and before that in his yeshiva. And this was actually something that happened pretty often, but one time really stands out. I just remember, I'm trying to remember which base Medjush we were in, but we were going at it literally for hours, like two, three hours. And we were getting very heated and very tzakach, like they say, and we were fighting about a concept, probably wasn't related to the Gemara itself. We were going into some type of discussion. So and, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I don't see your thumbnail now. I don't you know if that see, matters to you. I'm just telling you. You don't see me. Right. Right, but you see the screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I went off because it was it was kept on disappearing. I'm not sure why. Um, uh, so, so yeah, so it was just like, and what ended up happening was, is that turns out we really meant the same thing. We just had different words to describe that idea. And you were like, I was like exasperated. But it turns out we really, we really held the same beliefs. It's just that the words meant he had a different word for what he understood. And I had a different word. So it's important to define uh, the, the word that we're going to discuss here tonight um, to understand if the concept of self is good or bad. So what is selfishness? Selfishness is being concerned excessively or exclusively for oneself or one's own advantage, pleasure, or welfare, regardless of others. Selfishness is the opposite of altruism or selflessness, and has also been contrasted with self-centeredness. So selfishness is all about me. And that is essentially, um, if you had to split the, the world into two, that's the evil. That's the bad. It's the people who say it's all about me and I'm first and I don't care about you. So again, this is accentuating the question about how could we say that self is a good thing to be invested if, if anything that'll, that'll harness all the evil in the world and it'll make a, a, a me first type of an attitude. So first we have to get a little bit deeper and say, okay, what type typifies the archetype of the selfish person? If we really want to use an archetype which is a type of a person that really personifies the evilness of self, who is that person? And from there, we could understand our understanding of what is self and if it's good or bad. And that is the narcissist. Again, there's so many things I'm going to touch on tonight. There's really so many ways to go about this. I'm literally just touching things. But if, you, if you're paying attention, you'll hear a lot of different um, points. So narcissism, I put in parentheses, covert narcissism, because everyone, you know, it's not so hard to spot a narcissist if you have your eyes open. 
but there's a lot more covert narcissism. And I'm, I'm, I'm like I, what I call a machner in, in a lot of different areas, meaning I have very uh, strict, uh, I don't know if the word would be strict, but basically like I tell people like I'm a big machner in codependency. And uh, I point out to people a lot of times to show them that, you know, it falls under the rubric of codependency. And the same thing is with narcissism. There's a lot more narcissists than we realize. But who is the narcissist? It's a person who needs constant praise and admiration. That's a big, I underlined that word for a reason. A no, it's like the picture that we, as we're showing over here. A narcissist sense of superiority is like a balloon that gradually loses air without a steady stream of applause and recognition to keep it inflated. And the reason why is I picked the covert narcissist is because the, the, the overt narcissist we all hate. And um, it, it, it's very easy to hate him. The covert narcissist really is our next door neighbor, our friend, uh, our close relative. And it's more easy to have compassion on the person, although really they're both the same. They just have different coping mechanisms. And it's a wounded person. But this person needs that admiration to keep them inflated. And that word inflated um, is very much related to the Mid of Gaiva, which is really who the narcissist is, which is Gassis or Ruach. Literally, the word that we use for Gaiva is in Gassis is a large Ruach. It's inflated. It's a large inflation. It's, it's, it's amazing the words of Chazal, how they literally talk about this concept of narcissism. The occasional compliment is not enough. Narcissists need constant food for their ego. So they surround themselves with people who are willing to cater to their obsessive craving for affirmation. These relationships are very one-sided. Again, a lot of important points over here. It's all about what the admirer can do for the narcissist, never the other way around. And if there is ever an interruption or diminishment in the admirer's attention and praise, the narcissist treats it as a betrayal. This narcissist, um, for the point that we're trying to bring out, is the epitome of selfishness. It's the person who interacts with the world thinking about what it could do for them. And they rely on the world as a predator, whether in the overt or the covert, to get their sustenance that they need from you. That is the person who the selfishness is not just contained within themselves. And not only are they not, a, like, like we spoke last time about a chassid who's giving of themselves, but no, they're taking from you to make themselves. And the question is, where does this unhealthy version of selfishness come from? Who we meet in the street and in our workplaces and at our homes as an extreme as the narcissist. So first we have to understand an important ingredient that explains relationally why it is that the narcissist is selfish. And again, I'm just using the narcissist as the archetype. We all have these archetypes inside of ourselves in pieces. And depending how much toxicity you have inside yourself, that's how much you need to detox. Empathy is the ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes. And the reason why that's important is the level of happiness, intimacy, and connection that you feel in your relationships will always be directly linked to the level of empathy that both you and your partner have. The root of everything in relationships is empathy. And that's why actually I, I, I tell the people I work with all the time that if I was able to have one plaque hanging in my office i have everything clear clean clean walls but i had to have one it would say that when in doubt validate which validation is uh basically empathy behaviorally expressed empathetic bankruptcy is the common denominator of all toxic relationships so narcissism is essentially a problem of lack of empathy and there's many different reasons. And again, we're just picking we're just picking the narcissist as the archetype, but this is for all of us in our own selves as we relate to other people in different gradations and different proportions and ratios. 
What is it that prevents the narcissist from having empathy, thus voiding the healthiness of the relationship and just taking, which is called selfishness, only thinking about themselves? So one of the things is called self-absorption. The narcissist is totally absorbed with themselves. So they could only see themselves. They don't see you. And the reason for that is because they have a survival instinct. And we'll touch upon some of these things, but the reason is because he wasn't validated himself. He didn't feel safe in his own self. And he developed the survival instinct, which is always being self-conscious of the dangers out there in the world. So since he's so self-absorbed, or she is so self-absorbed, she cannot have empathy for you to connect with what you're going through. Second of all is disassociation. Although dissociation is generally uh, more of a, uh, a more complex psychological trauma, but uh, there, there's many different levels of dissociation. And the reason why the narcissist dissociates is to protect the false self. And that is they, they, the person that they show, and this is a big theme um, when we talk about, as we mentioned last time, about G'daylam, our Jewish um, leaders, in contrast to the secular celebrities, the contrast of what people look at them, which is the false self and their true self, it creates a, a, a disenfranchisement with who they really are, and, and they actually dissociate from who they are, and therefore they can't have empathy because empathy is after that you understand what feelings are, you then connect what your understanding of it with what the other person is feeling, but the narcissist is so far that they're actually not even connecting with their own self, let alone connecting with you, because they have to protect their false self. Third of all is that they're not really in tune with the real self. That's in general because it's too painful. It's 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 the, the to, to, it's very easy to, to uh, disconnect and to um, escape and um, to tune in to your feelings. Um, they have to be connected and they're not in tune at all with the real self because it's too painful, all the different emotions um, and the challenges of relationships. And finally, because the narcissist is delusional and in denial, which that's a coping mechanism um, for the all the wounds that come up when you're attacking them, or you're complaining to them, and that's too much for them to be able to handle because they don't have the resiliency as healthy people do. So therefore, those are some of the many reasons why a narcissist um, has this problem of selfishness in, let's say, relationships, um, due to the fact that they don't have the capacity and they don't practice empathy in relationships. Again, the, the, the narcissist is just all to protect us. We're using him as the architect, right? We all have peace of this, and this is something for us to be able to um, explore when we're discussing selfishness. So then the question is, okay, so... Let me, I just want to yeah. add one thing, not that it's very important. I feel like additionally, sometimes uh, children, people, whatever, receive unhealthy levels of praise, and in turn, they really think they're all that, or like, you know, a parent that would say, they're just jealous of you, you're amazing, you're great, they have this inflated sense of self. It's such like a, you know what, you bring up such an amazing point, because I'm actually about to touch parenting, uh, where obviously everything comes from, which actually I'm starting with some tomorrow, a Zoom class during the afternoons, um, parenting, uh, like a five minute tidbit, Mondays and Wednesdays, because everything starts from there, in the development of a child. Now, it's actually very interesting, the point that you're bringing up, because one would wonder, why would uh, giving, let's say, compliments to a child um, make them unhealthy? Shouldn't it build their sense of self to an extent that they're so strong and they don't need to be, they don't need to um, knock other people? In other words, um, if I am really so wealthy, so then I don't need to flaunt my wealth. It, 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 on the surface, it makes sense, the, the, the statement that you're saying, which is a true, it's a true statement. I'm just, uh, uh, to understand the origin of that statement, it, it, there's layers in it. Because 
Yeah, it would make sense. Oh, an overinflated sense of self. Oh, I, I, I was told I'm so great. I'm better than you. And therefore, you know, I become the narcissist. I become the unhealthy person where I, uh, I, I, I knock other people. The problem is it, it, just, it doesn't make psycholo- sense like psychologically because the reason why that doesn't make sense is because, actually, maybe I'll come back on as I do this. The reason well, why it doesn't make like sense. The aspect of better than you is not the right kind of message is you're amazing in this, but like a truthful, like you're amazing as you are, who you are, not that you're better than everyone else. Just the whole aspect of looking at yourself as better than everyone else automatically puts you on this pedestal to look at everyone else as lower. So that's just, that's just never the right kind of compliment for anyone. That's not a true sense of self-esteem. 100%. 100%. So, so to put what you're saying in, in, um, in a developmentally psychological context, when you give a message to a child that he's better than someone else, you're not telling the child anything about who and what he or she intrinsically is. Right. You're just, if anything, if anything, you're creating that, this is what Carol Dweck um, from Stanford University developed about the static mindset versus the growth mindset. If, if you're creating a sense of self based on the contrast to other people, you're setting them up for the, that type of mentality as the narcissist where your growth threatens my sense of self because I'm only good because I'm better than right. you. Right, exactly. Right, and, and, and another similar idea that, that it sounded like you were bringing up um, was the idea about when, when parents over compliment. So right. people say like oh so the kid thinks they're cinderella or whoever it is and and then like they're 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 better than everyone else it also doesn't really make sense because to the contrary if if i'm so good so then i'm healthy and i'm happy so then i would be gracious like we spoke about last time about the callus syndrome so the truth is that no that also is not good because if you over indulge in the compliments if it's true it resonates and then the person actually would be a gracious person the problem right. is, is that it's not true. And the child now feels threatened if they're not going to live up to that because you now just created a, a, a benchmark for me to feel good. Right. And, exactly. and that, cre- that, that I have to now develop that, what we call the false self. So that right. mask, so that, oh yeah, Shlemy's always happy. So, hey, how you doing? <laughs> I'm always happy. Oh, you're not happy? What, what happened? Why not? Oh, no, of course I'm happy. Oh, me? I'm always happy, right? Right. Yeah, we exactly. have to live up to that. So, yeah, so there's so many different, yeah, you're touching, as I said, we can go on this and I have no problem going whatever direction we're going to take. But, yeah, for sure, um, these are all um, related ideas to this concept. Right. So, so this is, so, so again, so where does this come from? Let's give an example. One, there's so many different sources of problems where, a person could have a problem with empathy. Um, there, here are 10 signs of what's called anxious attachment in adults. I'm not gonna go through the whole idea about it, attachment. There's healthy attachment, unhealthy attachment, maybe in the parenting class, maybe I'll go through that. Um, but how does a person know that if they have what's called anxious attachment? And this is so important where you see this in, in couples um Hassan Kala and people and starting in the early parts of relationships this co- comes up quite often um very much with intimacy so one is lacking a strong sense of self and low self-esteem a tendency to put others and their needs first a strong desire for relationships and intimacy and hard time being alone seeking approval and reassurances from others and again a lot of things overlap you know it doesn't mean it's this this is other things but the, the, you will have these things if, if, if there's anxious attachment, clingy and needy behaviors in relationships, strong fear of rejection, criticism and abandonment, becoming extremely upset when receiving disapproval, jealousy and frustration when the partner is unavailable or inattentive, overanalyzing and worrying excessively about relationships, and easily ignoring or misreading signs of relational issues. And the anxious attachment um, comes from 
a certain type of I'm a, ambivalent type of a parenting where not sure there's there's avoidant attachment there's there's different types the anxious is i'm not really sure am i going to get that from you and therefore i mean as a child and therefore in our adult lives we then we we go based on that model and this is one source of this is one type of uh, issue uh that could lead to narcissistic type of behaviors um where a person's really self-absorbed and all they can really see is themselves and they're anxious when it comes to relationships because if it's avoidance like okay i'm not i'm i'm, I'm, I'm not into relationships uh, and then if it's a different type it's it's just it's it's one type the anxious one is is really just thinking about myself as it relates to relationships and, and here's a little bit more to explaining it the anxious preoccupied attachment style is generally characterized by excessive worries about how one is perceived by others therefore anxious and by an extreme desire for proximity connection and quote merger with the attachment figure therefore preoccupied people with this attachment style often become obsessive and emotionally labile in their intimate relationships due to strong fear of rejection even the most insignificant sign of, un of un unavailability from the partner might lead to extreme jealousy and demonstrations of anger and distress. Again, these are the extreme. So most people are not thinking of this as themselves, possibly, but there's shades of this. And that's the anxious, preoccupied attachment style. And, and this, I think, really um, it, it illustrates um, the, the anxious attachment style which leads to the topic of codependency which is you will meet all of my emotional needs and you like you're my savior and that is not something that although it looks beautiful um that we're looking for codependency is using a relationship to fill a bottomless void due to not feeling whole and loved as an individual it's not the need to be loved that's the issue. It's the inability to love oneself that causes the dysfunction. And, and this really, this whole class is going to lead up to one, one idea um, to answer the question, is selfishness uh, good or bad? But this is like uh, the leaking bucket, which is that you could be filled up and the person is giving and giving and giving, but it keeps on leaking out because of the anxious attachment, because of the codependency, because you don't have your own container for your own emotions, for your own feelings, for your own life. And even if someone, you keep on going to the person to fill up your bucket, it's not going to help. It keeps on leaking out. This one I just like because of my profession, but I actually have this pretty often. It's not so funny. Um, and I have to tell people that, like, and in case anyone's listening to this on the phone, we need to deal with this constant need of yours to please others, says the therapist. And the client says, sure, if it makes you happy. And this actually happens uh, where it doesn't happen like that. But I have to say, you know, do me a favor. I need feedback and, and let me know. Is this helpful for you? Is this not helpful for you? You know, um, because that's what, that's what happens. It's, it's this whole people pleasing which all fill, fits into this codependency, to this anxious attachment. Will you like me? Um, this, this only thinking about myself, it's ironic because it's like, it sounds like that they're thinking about the other person. And this is, this is part of the shift that we're discussing in tonight's class. Everything they're thinking about the other person, which is all the kindness that they'll do and they'll let you come, like we spoke about last week about the light type of personalities, has nothing to do with you. It's all about them. Okay, so the question is, how do we get out of this? If this is what selfishness is, and we're, we're, we're this whole self class, we're up to class 13, and we're just deconstructing as we're just talking, we're so, this is like terrible. The self is just from the, the, the most unhealthiest people on the planet. So, why are we talking about the self as an ideal? So, let's start from the beginning. It says in the beginning of the Torah, the world was empty. God saw the light that it was good, and he separated it. So Rashi explains, what does this mean? He saw the light was good, 
And it wasn't appropriate for the light and the darkness, that they should be a confluence, an overlapping of the two of them, that they should be enmeshed. So he set the boundaries for light to be during the daytime, and for darkness to be at nighttime. What is this? What was the Tayyub Avayu? What was this whole chaos that the world was in? before God separated things, is what we call enmeshment. Enmeshment is a description of a relation between two or more people in which personal boundaries are permeable and unclear. This often happens on an emotional level in which two people, quote, feel each other's emotions, or when one person becomes emotionally escalated and the other family member does as well. And this is very interesting because I talk with uh, couples and spouses all the time about this, and this is one of my biggest uh, signs or symptomology that I say of my stringent interpretation of codependency that, yeah, of course I get when my spouse gets. I'm like, why? A good example of this is when a teenage daughter gets anxious and depressed and her mom in turn, in turn gets anxious and depressed. Now, some people might be listening and thinking, wait a second, isn't that empathy? Not necessarily. When they are enmeshed, the mom is not able to separate her emotional experience from that of her daughter, even though they both may state that they have clear personal boundaries with each other. Enmeshment between a parent and a child will often result in over-involvement in each other's lives, so that it makes it hard for the child to become developmentally independent and responsible for her choices. I think I actually spoke about this once, that uh, when my kids were young, and um, uh, one of my children were playing, and... Um, one of the uh, neighbor's kids, at least my child reported, beat him up. So this was right away in the beginning and before I learned my lesson. So I was like, what? He beat you up? I got stood up and went outside, knocked on the neighbor's door and the mother opened the door and she's like, yes. I'm like, oh my gosh, Lem, what did you just do? What, what am I doing over here? And I'm like, yeah, your son, this. And she's like, looking like, what? And I'm like, okay, wait a second. I just went home. I was like, wait a second. This is not the way it's supposed to be. And the next time my child came to me, what I did was validation. I was like, oh my gosh, what happened? How, what did he do? What happened first? And et cetera, et cetera. And then the kid felt heard and understood. And he continued, he ran off to continue playing. Enmeshment is when we're not able to separate ourselves from our child and we get reactive as if it's happening to ourselves, but we're not our child. We are our child's parent. We're not our spouse. We're our spouse's spouse. And enmeshment is a problem. That's toyhu vavoyu, that's chaos. And Hashem said that things have to have boundaries. Now, the Pasuk says, al ken yazif ishes avaves Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother. What is that? Individuation refers to the process through which a person achieves a sense of individuality separate from the identities of others and begins to consciously exist as a human in the world. One's unique self-identity, which is separate from that of any other individual, develops through the process of individuation. Individuation is ongoing and can be considered both a goal and a lifelong process. What happens is that a child is born to parents. And as we'll speak about in the Chinuch class, the truth is the child's sense of self is developed by the parents because that's all he knows. And they give him that sense of self. But what's important is that the child has to become an individual, has to individuate. Yazif ishes of his ima, he has to leave his parents to become himself. And that is the beginning of the answer of tonight's class what I call the paradox of connection. And there's a lot to speak about. I'm just going to touch the idea over here. It's interesting. There's a famous mitzvah called Kedoshim Tiyu. And really, if you think about it, a lot of Judaism, a lot of Yiddishkeit, and we'll have a chance in to talk about this in many different um, nuances. Kedoshim Tiyu, Kedusha. Everything's about Kedoshim, to be holy. Kedusha is everything. It's the holiest thing. It's the greatest thing. Now, what does it mean, holiness? So that's a, it's a huge topic, but there's a famous interpretation from the Torah's Kainim, which is the Midrashic interpretation of the Torah, that says, Prushim Tiyu. Kedusha means separation. 
separate from this world. Now, it's interesting, Reb Chaim Kanievsky, in his Birch HaSamazim, and the Bencher, they bring that he says by the Bracha of Rachim, when we talk about Hashem's hand, that it's Apsucha HaKadosha Varchava, it says Kadosha doesn't really fit over there. Psucha is open, Rechava is expansive, so where does Kedoshah come in over there? So he actually wants to magia. I'm not sure, I don't think actually in practice, but from what I recall, he says it should really say Hagadosh with a gimel. Hagadosh is overflowing. That really fits. Now, Rav Hirsch, as we mentioned many times, says that the words are, are, are syn- synonymous with if it has uh, in linguistically from one of the five places where the speech comes from. So in truth, the word Kaddish and Gaddish, the Kuf and the Gimel, both come from the same place, G, K, as it does in a person's speech. Now the problem is this would seem to be a paradox. How could Kaddish, which means to separate, be Gaddish, which is overflowing, which seems to be the opposite of separating? So, where do we find Kedusha? We find by a chasna, uh, many people don't know that there's actually two different halachas that happen at a chasna. There's Arisen, which we call Kedushan, and there's Nisu, and, and both of them we do at the same time by the, by the wedding, at the current day weddings. In Talmudic times, it was what's called a Yormit mitzvah because it was actually 12 months later, and it was on the Wednesday. Like I said, Basul Nisus Lema Revi, that's where the frame, famous phrase Ayyam and Amitvach comes from. It's actually a year later. We would have the halachic engagement, which is when we put the ring on the Kala's finger, is the Kedushin. What is Kedushin? Why is it called Kedushin? So too, it's interesting. Only after Kedushin, then a man has Nisuin. So actually, in halacha, what Kedushin is, the, the man is not permitted to the wife, she's just like any, she's forbidden to him as any uh, foreign woman. What Kedushin does, it separates her from every other man. Like we said, Kedushin to you is Mufrashim to you. You should be separate. That's what Taisa says. That's what Kedushin is. Then comes Nisuin. And the word Yod is going to be important as we're going to develop it. That man knew his wife, Chava, and they had children, which that's the word for intimacy. So do we have other places where we have the word Kedusha. We have Kiddush that we make Friday night and we make some other times. At a Chasna we make Kiddush too. And this Hektish, when we designate something for the sanctuary, for holy things, which essentially what Kiddush is, is really what Havdalah is through Das through connection. What does this mean? So, there's an irony in Kedusha, which, if I had to sum up the whole class, it would be this concept of what's called separate to connect. The Kedusha of Kedushin is that the woman is now separated from everybody else. Now she's ready to connect to her husband. So to Friday night, we make Kiddush. We're we're essentially saying we have now separated Shabbos from the rest of the week. And that is designated by making the Kiddush. And so too is Hektish, which we're saying that this thing is separated from everything else and now can be designated to a holier purpose. How, how does this happen? So there's a term that we've mentioned in the previous class, I believe it was class four, called Home Sweet Home, or was it class six? One of those classes. The term embodied self accentuates the understanding that self is not an idea, which many people, that's also one of my uh, pet peeves, is when people learn Machshava, which it's all about ideas, and that's not really what it's supposed to be. 
when you learn a safe like Maral, it's a lived experience. You feel it. And that's what this, uh, this uh, slide shows, that there's something called a felt sense, which is a very important concept. The felt sense is that sensation in your body with your mind and your feelings in the present moment, consciousness right here, is called felt sense. And really, that's what we said the Kala feels by the Badekin when her eyes are covered. Because now she's embodying that feeling of herself here separating from everyone and everything else, which is really what Hektish is. On some level, Hektish is a designation for a holy purpose. That's becoming you in the full sense of the word, in that felt sense of being you. Uh, there's an interesting Gemara in Shavuos, I'm not going to stress on it, but we spoke about it last time, making Havdallah on wine on Mocha Shabbos, if you recall, we spoke in last class, the Gemara says then a person has male sons, which is also the Bechina of a Mashpia, which is Lahavdal, it's a Havdallah, I just wanted to show that source. You can look into it yourself. But this, the Chacham, the Gemara says, the first bracha after Kedusha, which is actually the separation, we see the bracha of Das. And actually in that bracha of Das is where we make Havdalah in Mayra Matzah Shabbos. So the commentaries say, it's not just in, in Das Havdalah Minayin, which in simple understanding is, if you don't have intelligence, you can't make Havdalah, you don't know what a separation is. But you could also say, in Havdalah Das Minayin. If there's no separation, then there's no connection. Ba'adam yodas chavet means a connection that could only be if you know how to separate, then you could have connection. This, this, this is the main idea that we're developing with the selfishness. To be the self is not the end of all, but it is the, the prerequisite for connecting. You cannot have das. You can't have ba'adam yodas chavet ishtoi if she didn't separate the woman, she was a free agent. She could have married whoever she wanted to, but she first had to do Havdalah to do Das. You first have to be you to then connect with other people. And that's what the Pasuk says, V'davak It says, al You first have to do individuation, and then you could cleave to your wife, which is called interdependency in relationships. Codependency is, I can't make decisions on my own. Interdependence, not independence. Interdependence, which means two independent people, and that's important, that are connecting. I can decide, but I want you in the process. Codependencies, I cannot trust and rely on myself. I need you. Interdependence is, I trust myself and also trust you. Codependence is, I cannot handle being alone. Interdependence, I can be alone and be okay. Codependence, I cannot do me without you. I'm not sure I'll know who I am without you. And then interdependence is I know who I am on my own and can still be that person within the relationship. That is the objective of creating a sense of self so that you can then have healthy relationships. Only when you have that can you have what the Pasuk continues, and this is where it gets confusing, as most things in the world are, if you don't break it apart. Something called symbiotic fusion, which is like a dance, which most will say is unhealthiness, but not after you did everything we just spoke about. That regularly occurs in creative activity and empathic, intimate relationships, like this quote says. I didn't fall in love with you because I was lonely or lost. I fell in love with you because after getting to know you, I realized that I wanted to make you a permanent part of my world. A person has to be Yazif Ishas of his Imoy. Not because separation is the ideal, not because we want you to invest only in yourself. But if you don't invest in the self, then forever you will be the bucket, like the whole, the empty, the, 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 the bottomless pit, that you'll be constantly like the narcissist trying to 
to feed off other people to feed you. You have to first saturate the self. And that starts with, like the Pasuk says, Hasam Gevuleich Shalom. He placed your boundaries as peace. A boundary is a limit or a space between you and the other person. A clear place where you begin and the other person ends. Healthy boundaries can serve to establish one's identity. Specifically, healthy boundaries can help people define their individuality and can help people indicate what they will and will not hold themselves responsible for. Very important. That responsibility goes both ways in the person themselves, when they should take responsibility and when they should not. A complete lack of boundaries may indicate that we don't have a strong identity or are enmeshed with someone else. Now, shared meaning does not mean that people see things the same way, but that they understand each other's perspectives well enough to accept them. It's fascinating idea from the Maral and Gurus Hashem, which even he says is fascinating, and if Maral is saying it's fascinating, it's very deep, as he himself says that. He says in words, Shem Perk Mem Gimli, he says, The Masham, at this that Chazal, the sages tell us, Shah Noshim Tzidkani is Niskokin Lam. Very fascinating idea that it says that the, the righteous women in Egypt, they were intimate with their husbands, Beina Mishpasayim, by the boundaries. Why? Says Maral, who dava Amuk Moy, this is so deep. And, and this is literally saying the concept we're saying here tonight. Kirit Sayyid Alayma, what they want to say is like this. They had the total unification that that um, companionship that marriage has. That's called between the boundaries. Why? Why would that be between the boundaries? That's where the boundaries connect. That's by the boundaries of the fields. Like they have by South and North Korea. It's not me. It's not you. It's interdependence. There's a shared meaning that we have together. I am my country. You are your country. And you need to be you. The unity of the Intimacy is not on my turf or your turf. It's Bein Hamish Pasayim. You need to be you and I need to be me. That is interdependence. Unbelievable idea. There's so much we could talk about this. But let's just talk about some related ideas. Psychological safety is the ability for a group of people to take risks and be vulnerable with each other without fear of getting punished for mistakes. As opposed to gaslighting, which is a concept we're not going to talk about right now, but that's a uh, one of the tools that narcissists and others will use, which tries to make you think you've made a mistake even when you haven't. Psychological safety encourages a culture of trying new things, speaking openly, and creativity, among other benefits. By, th- by sending the message that you are really seeing and hearing what you think you are, and that we are all living in the same reality, yes and, which is a very important concept, instead of saying the word but, Yes, and builds psychological safety in teams and encourages behaviors that are critical to innovation and constructive change, which this is all part of the Bain Hamish Basayim, which is, this is not my terms, my culture, my language, my, my, my country, or nor yours. This is uh, uh, the, the, the uh, non-armament. This is, this is the, the safe zone between the different countries and some practical skills that, ap- that apply to this Approach conflict as a collaborator, not an adversary, which many people do because we're defensive because we have that wounded ego and we're being defensive. We have that anxious attachment. Speak human to human. So officially the highest level of validation in DBT, the sixth level is just human to human. We're, 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 we're on equal playing field. Anticipate reactions and plan counter moves, meaning be mindful when you're coming to a, a situation. Four, replace blame with curiosity. Very big one, which is, it's 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 oh it's called open mind. It's, you know, not blaming, just like yeah, like okay, wow. So what do we do now? Ask for feedback on delivery, which is a basic for any therapeutic relationship or any relationship. And finally, measure psychological safety, which is this idea, like keep on checking in to see does the person really feel safe. Doesn't necessarily mean by asking directly, but continuously measure uh, that safety. Now, actually, a, a new term that was developed. What's called green lighting um, is is saying in contrast to gaslighting, 
is saying yes to our whole being experience, both human and divine. Green lighting is a radical acceptance of whatever is currently arising in order to bring it fully into conscious awareness where it can be integrated. A major reason for green lighting the human aspects of ourselves is to free greater amounts of energy and attention to facilitate deepening awakening. This principle does not necessarily mean uninhibited behavioral expression without consideration of the impact on others. The point of green lighting is to teach the participants to accept and hold themselves consciously. This is done through the example provided by the teacher and other participants. That's opening up the room for the other person um, to, to be who they are. And what does it mean in practice, shared meaning? So Dr. John Gottman, who actually is a, uh, is a uh, religious Jew, suggests that, and he's, he's the guru of relationships, he suggests that couples create shared meaning through the use of rituals, roles, goals, and symbols. As you begin your life together, it will be important and fun to establish these things as a way to give purpose and meaning to relationships. So what's interesting is, and this is what we're talking about over here, that it's not my country nor your country. Ask each other, what does home mean? Like, and this is what we had with the vignette that I opened up with my brother Dudley when we're learning. Like, what do the terms mean? What does home mean? What does intimacy mean? What does money mean? What does play mean? Each of these words is a symbol for some broader idea. What kinds of goals do you have for these ideas? You may not even know until you start the conversation. Creating shared meaning is one of the most rewarding facets of a marriage. It can be awesome, messy, agonizing, joyous, elusive, fun, risky, maddening, invigorating, mysterious, and all of these at once. And that requires vulnerability. And we can only be vulnerable if we feel safe, psychological safety. And that is if we are able to be who we are. And this is the last one. If we're feeling attached in a relationship, and our partner hasn't texted us back or called to check in, we may take it personally or as a comment on the relationship. When the truth, their communication, or lack thereof, is entirely about them and their choices, which is a skill called emotional detachment, which is the ability to pull ourselves out emotionally from what's happening in the moment, which is so interesting because this is the paradox of Kedusha, which is what people find so difficult when I first introduced them to this idea that they feel that relationships are supposed to be this type of like enmeshed relationship and what they feel I should feel. And that is true when we're able to um, get to the end result that we're trying to reach for. However, first thing that we need to get is we need to saturate the self with that felt sense of being, which we all crave. If we do that, if we are totally comfortable who we are, then we're not being reactive. We, 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 we naturally do this detached mindfulness, which what the, the irony is, is that we can actually have empathy if we're not codependent. If we are codependent and we seem to be only caring about you, when this essence we're really just taking from you, it's really just protecting ourselves and therefore we get so worked up when you get worked up, we feel threatened. When, when I, tell, I tell husbands all the time, I go, you're afraid of your wife? What is she going to do? You're 6'2 and she's 5'4. Well, what exactly are you afraid of happening? But they can't handle it because they're so defensive because the child self is feeling threatened and they have this anxious attachment. It's only when you're Yazif Ishas of Vesimai, when you individuate and you become who you are, you're Hasam Gavulech, then you could have Shalim. When you have the boundaries and you have the understanding of who you are and you're independent, then you could have interdependence. So this answers the question that we start off tonight's class. Is selfishness good or bad? And the answer is that it's both. There's healthy and unhealthy. A person first needs to be who they are. They need to invest in themselves. If you become you, then you don't need to continuously try to become you by 
getting nourishment from other people because you already saturated your sense, your felt sense of being. And you walk around the world like that. Those are the people who are, like we said, chesed, eshed. They can overflow and they can actually connect with other people. They could be like the chesed to allow other people to come into their home like Avram Avinu. But if you never did, then you are eternally selfish because you're always absorbed with the self and protecting the self. That is the answer to the question that many people struggle with, that it, what is selfishness? Is it good or bad? And that is, it's good as a stepping stone to becoming bigger and bigger. But the people that we identify as selfish are the adults that have not healed from their child, their wounded child self, who are walking around still selfish. That is the unhealthiness. That is, that was tonight's class. So, um, uh, it's, it's so much to say, and, and e even from the archetypes um, that we touched on. Um, and there's so many of these pieces in all of us. Um, but that was, that was, the, that was the, the, the idea. Any comments? I have comments. So I loved everything that you said. I felt like everything was like right on target, super important. Like everyone needs to know this. Like everyone, everyone. It's like stuff. There's like, um, you know the Torah better than me. So you can go into all the drushim and say, the Torah really means this. The Torah really means that. But from my childhood schooling, and even just like being like part of B'nai Yisrael in this world, there's like a, a general feeling of this submissiveness and selflessness that seems like the ideal. And I wonder why, if it's more so like how you're saying, why is that the feeling that I get from like how you're supposed to be? I mean, I don't agree with it. But from my schooling, that's what I feel. And you're, from so many... That, those vibes that you were just communicating was really the underpinning of why I gave this class. I didn't say it the way you said it, but that was really the safe the, the, maisa That was the question that I know niggles at most people. And that's why I gave this class. But yeah, you gave the thrust of it by asking the question that way. Now, by so asking the question, the question is why? Way, Wait one second, there's more to that with what I'm saying. I want to know, like, for example, like you're saying that the child has to leave with the parents. The whole, I get it that there's like so many halachas within halachas, but the whole concept of kibbutz of aim, although I know that there's things like, well, if you're going to have to lie or say, even if it's your parent, you're not supposed to, but still on a whole, the, the feeling that you get is that like, you have to do anything and everything for your parents. Although I know when it comes to your husband, whatever, you're supposed to listen to your husband first, whatever. But still, the whole feeling that most people get in that regard is like everything for the parents. So, and I agree with you that it's hard to feel this sense of self when it's like all for the parents. Additionally, this concept that Chava came from the rib of Adam Rishon, you know, just, you know, so he can have a companion that... Although I feel that, you know, men and women are equal, that very much feels like we're there just to serve our husband. That, that just like that story doesn't make this like big separation. I, I understand that what you're saying, this interdependence, but do you get what I'm saying? That like it gives this feeling of enmeshment more like what you were saying, how you're not supposed to have that enmeshment. Additionally, I just had a number of points that I wanted to get across. When you said about this concept of, you know, being separate and then the children have to be separate and they learn. And then when your child, you know, is beat up, you know, you're supposed to like validate and the ch child feels better. I, I know that you were just giving an example, but I also feel like, there's, although there's boundaries, it's 
not necessarily like super clear boundaries. There's also an aspect of a parent protecting the child and a child, when it sees a parent standing up for the child, I don't mean all the time, certain times, a parent, a child feels protected. So as much as I feel like a child is supposed to learn how to do things on their own, there's also a concept of a parent protecting the child, doing things for the child, that it, it feels loved and protected. And then additionally, you know, certain times it's like, okay, now you're riding your bike on your own. Now you have to stand up for yourself, whatever. It's not a major point, but I'm saying it's not so clear. This is my opinion, at least. Um, what else did I want to say? Uh, yeah, this aspect of enmeshment and separateness, like between a husband and wife, I feel like that's also like a little bit blurred at certain times. Well, not just with a husband and wife, the aspect of empathy, like you can feel the moment you have empathy, like really trying to put yourself in someone's place, you are going to feel some tsar, but you also have to separate yourself from the person. It's, you're not that person, but at the, so you shouldn't take the whole all upon yourself, but there is a level of feeling for the person and you can feel some tsar for the person that's going through something. And there are certain times where you are supposed to be selfless. I mean, that's my feeling, at least. It's not like a clear cut, I'm separate, they're separate, whatever. Anyway, those are just basic points, but I loved everything you said. Now you could respond to what I said. Well, I would have to give a class on each one of those points because they're all, uh, they're, they all hit, hit it on the, on, on the money regard to the questions. Um, I could touch them briefly. Oh, wait, I had one more question. I want to know for people that don't have a sense of self, they're an adult, and their whole life they felt a certain way. How do they find and get this sense of self when their whole life they're like giving it to someone else? The, like it's so, I find that it's so hard for them like to even know what that even is. How do they get there? How do they find it? What do they do? Okay, that's the last question. I mean, that's the last point. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, 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 that's a much bigger topic. Right. Um, really and that, and we have touched upon it also. And actually, that was the other class I was possibly going to give tonight. Um, um, but that's, that's a whole different uh, discussion. Um, okay. Regarding all those other points, they, they, it's true there it's let's say let's take the example the last point you said before this last one um regarding empathy right empathy um is true in our words of chazal we call it i'm not it's sure which class, right i'm not sure which class i gave it and maybe not in the zoom class maybe one of my other classes um but i speak about meisha benu Vayar Vayigdal Moshe, which we, we spoke about in the last class, becoming a gadol, um, becoming a big person, which you see other people as yourself. And it says, Vayar Moshe B'Sevloi Sam. Moshe Rabbeinu saw their pain. And the reason why that's so important is because he was able to see their pain. When you're a healthy person and you're already saturated with being you, so you're not there to protect yourself because you already know yourself. And I don't need you to make me me. So he could see other people's pain, but it was their pain, not his pain. Right. He didn't interject their pain as his own. That's a childish thing to do. It's, it's, it's developmentally, developmentally immature, which is what narcissists are to an extreme, which we all have pieces of this, that we, we're not really mature. and we, we interject your emotion as if it's mine. That's not mine. That's not what empathy is. Empathy is me feeling your emotion. So right. that is... Uh, 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 of course, yeah, you're going to feel some type of a pain, you're going to feel some type of love and joy, but it's not going to be that same exact one. It's you and it's me. That's that. Right. Regarding the woman, that's also a whole different class that I actually, I gave it in the girls' high school. It's on Torah anytime also, the audio classes, explaining uh, the, 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 the interesting role that, yeah, that a feminist might be offended by the fact that the woman's role is to assist the man, but it's so crazy how the redefinition of what it really means, it actually, and it, it's, see, I don't even like saying, because when you answer such a question, it almost sounds like you're apologetics. It's not apologetics. No, 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 no. by the way, I'm not saying it in an, like, right. that I right. take it you in an offensive way. You were saying it's just a way of understanding, like it's enmeshed. 
So actually, right. Chazal actually tell us that man and woman were actually originally created androgynous. There was the front and the back, and they were actually two halves of one whole. Then they were split because there's two interpretations in the Gemara. It actually wasn't a rib. That's actually not, not none of the Gemara's interpretations. It's, it's, it's Hatzela. It doesn't mean a rib. It actually means a side. So either mm. it was a part of him or the back of him. But be that as it may, it was, it was part of him, and then it was separated. And then he said, that this is, oh, this, is, this is a part of me, which actually speaks to the tellingness of the oneness that's supposed to come from that, which they start off one, and then it's independence and then interdependence, which actually this developmental cycle that we're talking about, which a child starts off in mesh, in the mother's womb, in the stomach, then cuts the cord, individuates, becomes his own self, and then reattaches. So that's actually the answer to is selfishness good or not. Developmentally, in the beginning, it's necessary. That's what right. we keep on talking about. But the ultimate goal is actually to have this symbiosis. Is that is, yeah, what happens to you happens to me. I feel your pain. But that's only after you did that's the so work. That's so beautiful. I'm just thinking of your example, and I'm feeling it. Like the baby detaches and then reattaches. That's mm -hmm. so beautiful. Yeah. Exactly. And it's actually the same way it came, whatever. It's, it's very deep. There's a lot of different ideas over here to that. Now, regarding, let's say, the question you asked regarding Kibbutz Aveim, so, um, we, we, in the entire, we talk in absolute terms. And the truth is, is that uh, the whole objective of, um, it's actually funny because um, my cousin, Johnny Gwertz, he actually, I, I got an email today. I, I usually try responding to him. I was gonna, I meant to email him back, beautiful. He actually, he wrote an article that he put out. I don't know where he does, but he sends it in emails. And uh, right, so he it's, uh, he calls it Operation Inspiration. So he um, he was speaking about that on Shabbos. He saw this little blonde-haired girl in the tent, minion that he was davening. She came running to her father, and he said, like you know, she she was just she was hugging onto his foot. Um, and the father couldn't really respond because he was davening as the, as the chazan, as, as the, the shleich tzibur. And he said, it's such a shame that when, you know, you see by children everything, when they're sad, they run to daddy. When they're happy, they run to daddy. When they get older, then they, um, then they suddenly stop. And it's a shame because there's so much beauty to have to be able to, to share that with a parent. And he was saying it the same thing with, with God, that, you know, that we get disillusioned, then we, we stop our relationship with God. So when we talk about keep it out of the aim, keep it out of the aim, and that's actually a whole, that's actually related to the class about the mirrors that we spoke about. I think we actually mentioned there a lot of different items that we have to respect. And parents are like that because parents are our mirrors. They remind us of who we are. And that's why people a lot of times find it difficult to speak with parents because the parent, like, like they're always holding the memory of who you are. So the reason why, in, 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 in Judaism, honoring parents is, is paramount is, is simply because it, it, it's the hope that, that, that reminds us of, of who we are, that we should continue being ourselves. Now, there, that's the healthy version. There's obviously um, nuances, like it is in all of life, like we're saying, is selfish good or not? The same thing could be, there's a lot of trauma that could come up um, with parents too. And there are halachas actually for that, you know, regarding abusive parents and, and things like that. Um, but regarding um, enmeshment, enmeshment is unhealthy. And it's not supposed to be that we identify ourselves with our parents or we identify ourselves with our children. We are independent of them and we are interdependent. And that's the healthy unit of an individual in their environment. It's Go to yourself, become you. And then when you become you, then you could then reattach as a gadol does. Bigger and bigger concentric circles becoming who you are in relation to all these other people. But that's not enmeshment. And that's not what Kibbut Av Aim wants from the person. Actually, even Haloch, it's Kibbut Av is Mishal Av. It's actually from their finances, not from your own. It's not, it doesn't come at your expense of who you are as an individual. That's not what the Torah requires from a person. So that's regarding Kibbutz Aim. Obviously, there's a lot more emotional pieces, but that's just for the 
um, the conceptual understanding. And what else was there? Did I address all of them? Was there one more? Um, I don't know. Just the, oh, I said about protecting the child. Uh, oh, yeah. Whatever the boundary. Of course, of course. Of course, you have an obligation to protect the child and uh, to protect other people, too. Um, the, no, it's the like giving a feeling of protection, you know, like the child feels like I have my Tati. I mean, kind of like how we look at Hashem, Hashem protects us, right? It's uh, like, well, and what is, and what is Hashem that kind do? of idea? And Hashem gives us independence. Hashem, right. it's exactly, you actually said the answer. We're actually Yeah, I know, I, I realize that, but I feel like the difference is with the parent, we actually see the parent. You know, and we're able to see when the parent stands up for us. Exactly. It gives us. But that doesn't mean that they well, take I away. Mean, that, but that's not taking away our independence of who we are. The, we need to allow no, the child sure. to become. Yeah. So the point about. I feel like a course, combination. A hundred percent. You know. I was only like pointing out. Times, the right. No, side. I get it. I get it. Again, I mean, this is just based on a feeling that I have. That there's a level of like. You know, the parent, the child sees that, like, the parent's protecting them. I have my tati. But then other times, like, no, you can do it. Tell him that made me feel bad or blah, 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 stuff like that. And whatever, like a combination. More so, I'm saying, for children than, you know, adult children. Because the small children, they're in the process of learning things. Right. So that's whatever. why, that's why, that's why I say when I, for that, 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 uh, posted that I said that I put up in my office. The words are 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 precise. I say, when in doubt, validate. Right. And the reason right. for that is because a lot of times this happens with husbands and wives more the the husband towards the wife, where he's like, uh, what, what, "What do you want me to do? I, I, I don't know what to say anymore." Right? Do you want me to right. help you? No, you get upset when I help you. You say, "I'm, I'm not understanding. I'm not listening to you." So 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 so, uh, right? So I say, right. when in doubt, validate because, you know, more often than not, they just want you to feel what they're feeling and to understand them and that, that they're what's called in Hebrew typhus mocking by you, that, 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 that they're taking up space in you that you're feeling their pain with them. But that doesn't mean always to validate. Sometimes, yeah, if you always say like, oh, wow, that must be so hard. Or it's so hard. I need help. Oh, oh, that must be so hard that you need help, right? No, if you're doing, if you're only doing validation, you're not doing your role as a, uh, father, husband, child, whatever it is. Um, right. When in doubt, validate. But of course, yeah, sometimes it needs problem solving. Sometimes it needs uh, taking action. So yeah, definitely. I was just... What if a person is trying to validate, but like, no, they want to validate, but it's hard for them to see the other person's point of view that even though they want to validate, because they're unable to see the point of view, it can only come from like, a, you know, fake i don't know sort of patronizing way oh that must feel really hard because they don't they're not able to see like for me a very big example was remember that uh, blue dress black and blue dress and the white and gold right mm -hmm. i was floored that some people saw it white and gold i i thought like i remember i asked mommy and she was like white and gold i'm like you're messing with me right and that, for me, was such a strong example that, like, as much as, you know, I see things pretty clearly in the world, like, someone else can have a totally different reality. Their eyes were literally seeing something else. But it would be hard for me to say, oh, I, I see how you can see it, white and gold. I mean, enough people said white and gold that I was like, okay, eyes see things differently, blah, blah, blah. And when you know the science behind it, it makes sense. But what if you have trouble seeing what the, per you know, seeing someone what the person so, is so, so validating? That's such a great point because um, definitely um, the last thing we want as, as, as uh, people asking you for help is patronizing. We don't want people patronizing us because that's so disingenuous and we feel right. even worse when people do that to us. Um, right. The job which you're pointing out and illustrating is actually to actually see that other person's perspective, to find what's called a nugget of truth in what they're saying. Now, that generally could be done, but the question then becomes is like, what I mean, let's say I can't. So actually, actually, there's 
I was gonna maybe use it in one of the other, um, in one of the other classes. But there's such an unbelievable. It's actually a whole class in its own right. But I'll show you the quote. I think you'll appreciate it. It's in one of the other classes. Uh, let's see. Uh, where did I put it? Oh, wait a second. Where is it even? I didn't see it. Where did it go? I thought I made it. Is it here? No. Some things are not even showing. Oh, here. Oh, that's why it's by recent. One second. See all. Okay, now it should be here. No, not here, not here. All right, no, let me type it in. So, 14, no, <laughs> it's never coming up. I don't know. Anyway, so there was a, it's a quote. Basically, the quote goes that, um, not even here, that's so interesting. Um, the quote goes that, um, that, we don't, see, we don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. Right. Which it's, it's, it's a nice uh, quote, but there's a lot of depth to it, which is the truth is that we only see as purified as we are. The reason why we can't relate to another person's point of view is because we're egocentric. We are so beholden to our own beliefs and our own opinions. That is, it sounds a little bit like... Um, uh, let's say uh, spiritual, the concept I'm saying, but it's psychological too, is that is we have biases that don't allow us to see or to understand another person's perspective because it's not a part of who we are. If we're right. able, and again, it's, 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 it's not a, I'm not going to have to give it over because it's a whole class in its own right, but that's why we can't really, but you're right. The, the, that's why we can't see their perspective, but the objective would be for validation is actually to get to actually see their perspective and to try to understand where they could be coming from not necessarily that I agree to it or if I fully grasp it, but to find a nugget of truth in what they're saying or to even understand that they could have such a feeling or such an opinion to understand that there, there is such an, a possibility that that's the objective of, uh, of validation. And that, Sometimes that's, if, you, if you haven't gone through, let's just say certain people have, they lose their temper really quickly. I don't know what that feels like. Maybe, you know, the other person is like calm and easygoing and to them, it seems insane, right? Unless somehow later on in life or something, that person like goes through stuff where they, I don't know, they're more anxious and they lose their temper. Then it's like, ah, now I get what they were feeling. But until that point, the person could have like totally no clue what the other person feels like. So what are you supposed to do? Like uh, for so, me, so yeah, right. okay, so I'll cool. answer. I'll answer it conceptually. Emotionally, okay. it, it requires our own class in itself. But the concept okay. is that we've given this when we spoke about it in the uh, the micro and the macro. Mm -hmm. the, the the reason why gedolim are called gedolim, like we said, is because they're able to reach deep inside themselves to be able to understand what's happening outside themselves. Everything in the big world, we're called the olam katan, a small world. Everything in the big world is inside me. And that's why if you learn the Hasidic Shaswam, especially, they talk about the Haman that's inside of you, the Mordechai that's inside of you, the, uh, the, 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 the Pari that's inside of you, the Moshe that's inside of you. All the world is inside of every single person. And that's why you're actually able to connect and resonate and relate to what you see is because that piece is inside of you. Right. So the reason why you're not connecting with them is because you're not really connected with yourself. And that's really what the quote is. You, we don't see things as they are, but as we are, we, we have blocks that don't let us see them because we're not fully connected with that part inside of ourselves. Again, it's a deep concept, but that's just, I think you could understand the idea, although. Oh, I hear what you're saying, yeah. but let's just say the concept of grief. Certain people have not gone through certain types of so that's grief. Saying. To so even like, know what that feels like. Right, so I gave I gave this example I think on one of these classes that when I used to give groups at Ocean Mental Health, and you know I was giving a group on addictions, and mm -hmm. the guys were like, "Yeah, we don't mean to be disrespectful, Solomon, but but what do you know about addictions? You ever you know uh, did acid? You you ever you know uh, shot up heroin? Right? So I said, 
actually that was what the class I was giving were showing the different um, symptomology of addiction. And I said, each one of those I can relate to in my own way. Doing things, something, even though you know it's not good for you, um, blacking out and just eating a whole bag of chips, you know, and before you know it, it's gone. These are all, it's just in a different context, a different setting, a different level, a different application, but the concepts are inside of every single person. And the great people are able to connect with what you're saying because they're connected totally with themselves. Okay, so let's just say a person is not on that great level. What are they supposed to do if they want to identify and validate someone and they don't know what it feels like? What should they do? So I'm saying, so essentially the work is connect with yourself. Like everything comes back to the self. Right. If it's right here in the moment, like I always give the example that the girl in seminary who asked me, she was like, you know, Rabbi, you know, what should I do? Should I listen to Christian a cappella or should I listen to, to, to Jewish music during Sphira? Like, who said, oh, why are you asking me a question now? Like, who said either one is a good option? You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, what should oh, I do I then? That and the hobby. You have to do what's <laughs> called, you have to cut your losses. Cut your losses. You try your best. You, you try to understand as much as possible and you try to be as genuine as possible and try to connect on some level and something, you know, that you could, that you could, feel or understand that they're going through and there's some level that that you try to find that connection that that would be the objective in that moment so even though you never lost this or you never had that experience but you could is it okay to be honest and say i feel bad that you're going through this but i really don't know what you feel like i i, I feel for you though i'm saying you're not relating to any you know nikuda of what they're going through but you're at least being honest and saying that I, I feel for you that you're going. Yeah, I have through. no idea. I have no idea what you're going. Yeah, again, it depends on the person, it depends on the delivery. Yeah, but like I have no idea what you're going through, and I wish I could be there for you or whatever. Yeah, it depends how. Yeah, that's that's, that's whatever. That's, I mean, that to yeah. me at least yeah. feels like a genuine aspect. Whatever. I mean, I didn't think this before I asked you the question. I'm just thinking that I know a lot of people don't know how to validate because they really have no clue. But anyway, art. Yeah. Okay. Very good. I All really, right. really enjoyed this class. Awesome. I'm excited to continue. Thank you so much, Slimy. And um, I don't know if anyone else has questions. I see people did sign back on. This uh, self-project class, this self-project class at gmail.com. Again, I, I, I also need feedback because I'm like, uh, this takes so much time. You don't understand? Because the ideas, the ideas are very, I have, there are billions of the ideas in my head. But to, to, to constrict it and put it into a class, it just, it, it, it's nitty gritty. It takes takes the, that focus, you know, to put into a product, you know, package. I love class. I, if I just like to flow, I can go for hours. I go to seven o'clock in the morning now if we just, if we just talk and smooth. But to, to put it down into a, into a framework, it takes energy. So um, anyway. Well, I like, enjoyed the class. I shared the class. Um, like Zahava listened to it later on. She enjoyed it. We referenced back to the class. So that's my feedback. I thought it was amazing. I thought this class was amazing and I feel like it's very Yeah, I got good helpful, feedback. Perfect. Instrumental yeah, and awesome. Thank you, Solomon. Yeah, I appreciate you. Well. All right. Take Great. care. Thank Have a good you. night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.